Well, hello and welcome to the 20, July 23 mm -hmm. edition of the ACES Economist Board. I'm John Nelson from m and and I'm joined today by Keith Prather of Armada. How are you doing today, Keith? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Got a little bit of yard work going in my background, but uh, hopefully yeah. it doesn't go up and we don't hear it. Cleaning up from the storm. <laughs> yeah, we actually had a tornado here. So uh, yeah, I actually went through my yard. Do, I didn't realize it was a full-blown tornado. Yeah, we have neighbors that have photos of it as it was coming down. And uh, it's odd, but it literally was a small enough one. It just hit my house. <laughs> oh, geez. But no no damage to the house itself. No, not at all. Not at all. But I, but I think we will be contributing to probably the uh, industrial production and manufacturing model this month in some some way because uh, the, the activity that's going to take place and reconstructing part of my yard is, is, is going to contribute to the economy. So Okay, well, so... Challenge accepted. As we're looking at this and explaining industrial production to our listeners, I want you to say how your how the tornado that hit your backyard is a shaping this curve. So <laughs> that that along can, with the other eighteen to twenty economic indices that we're using. So. I can do that. I can do that when we get to the machinery sector. For those of you who subscribe and and look at the machinery model. Uh, when we get to that, I can I can promise you the machinery around my house right now churning up trees and uh, you know the Vermeers of the world and those manufacturers are benefiting because uh, we're driving business. <laughs> All right. Well, with that lead in, let's just jump right on into the models. There you go. All right. So I'm going to get my screen up and here we go. This is industrial production and. Uh, Okay, a couple things to, to note. The overall story, as we were discussing before, remains pretty much the same. What's different is where you saw a little bit of a sharper increase right away, and then it's kind of a tailing off. You get a little bit of a flattening period instead now and a tail off. You see that little bump on the chart. It can kind of fool your eyes when you're only talking about a single percentage point on an index, don't worry about that bump so much. You, the scale on this is really, really small. So even if you look all the way out there at the far at 18 months, you see that little hook. That that little hook is like 0.5 of a percentage point. So it, it's kind of what I would call decimal dust at this point. Just ignore it. Just look at that overall trend there. But you can kind of see we're telling the same story that we did the month before, uh, you know, just a gentle uh, staying pretty flat, but a little bit of a decline for the next 18 months. Yeah. So, so John, we get monthly survey reports that aren't part of the ACES, but uh, you know, there's a couple of different organizations around the U.S. that actually collect manufacturing data and uh, the purchasing managers indexes. And when you look at the PMIs, uh, you know, they're showing this general weakening trend. And we do see it across both the ISM survey and the S&P global surveys. And, you know, new orders are weaker. Um, we're getting some peak season, you know, second half of the year forecasts now that show that this year the U.S. is probably going to experience um, a, a very odd peak season. And, and it's it's interesting because we don't have a lot of data in the models that show this. But what's fascinating is when we think about inbound containers into the United States getting ready for the peak retail season, um, we see a flatter period heading into November than we would have normally seen in a regular year. And then in November, we get a nice little surge in container activity. And there are a couple of different forecasting organizations that are they're showing that, like the retail um, National Retail Federation. And so we get a little bit of that November surge, and then it tails off after that. And what's fascinating to me is that when you lay this curve on top of what some of the National Retail Federation is showing and some of the other peak retail forecasts, you can see that little bump coming in toward the end of the year. It's almost like inventories dip and then companies start to reorder and build into the very end of the year to get through Q1. And then with, with inventories rebuilt and it looks like maybe a little bit of a weaker forecast for 2024, then you get this deceleration on the backside of that. And I was again, discounting that bump, but obviously yeah. it's our brilliance to put that bump in there. So <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing about it is as you said, even though it's just you know one percentage point or less. So we don't we don't look at that bump as being significant, other than the fact that the model's picking up mm -hmm. a little bit of an improving trend through that period. It's seeing something that's that's keeping it from going into that decline trend sooner. 
And so it shows a little bit of strength, or even if it's a, if, if, if it's, we call it flat through the end of the year, it's still seeing that flat trend, at least until we get into Q1 of next year. And then we, then we start to see the deceleration off of that. Okay. Well, let's see what it, what it looks like long-term. You know, there's, you can kind of get a better sense of this tailing off now. Uh, that we've been talking about because it definitely drops below trend for the 20 year trend. And that that has been the 10 year trend. If you look at the period starting about 2013 and moving forward, you can see that uh, the trend line would be about the same. Uh, so we are definitely dropping below trend uh, once you get out about, you know, seven, eight months. Yeah, and, and again, we pointed this out before last month. And again, we're watching, we do these every month because we're looking for changes in that long-term cycle. It's that business cycle that companies care about and us trying to give them four to six months of warning before a change in cycle occurs. And so here, what we would be looking at, John, is obviously what we've talked about before, is that this is giving us a hint of maybe a soft recession or a soft landing. Um, some will call it a rolling recession where some industries go into recession, um, before others. And then as, you know, new industries start to see some softness, others are rolling out a recession. So it's, it's almost like a cycle that kind of looks like this instead of everything going in and coming out at the same time. And so what we're showing here is at least the model's giving us an idea that out there about 18 months out, there's at least a bottoming process occurring. So the model is seeing something that's telling it that unless it's a false positive, that there's, you know, maybe some optimism that you kind of get into the second half of 2024 and that maybe that cycle is changing and turning and we get into a growth cycle. So um, it, we'll go with that for now. I mean, again, it looks like as a manufacturer, you're going to see fits and spurts of activity through probably Q3 this year before you hit that downturn cycle, which gives you a little more time to, to kind of prepare a little more in earnest for that downturn. Sure. Well, let's take a look uh, a little further up the, the value train chain and look at the uh, primary metals and primary metals. It's still showing the slight softening uh, there towards the tail end of it, uh, or, or as, as we move forward, much the same as what we were seeing in the May forecast, although not as, uh, not as severe, if you will, uh, as what we were seeing before, but generally telling pretty much the same story uh, maybe a little bit more positive. Well, yeah. I mean, if you look at that scale, and maybe you can talk more to that, but before the model was looking at 75 points on that scale, yeah. now it's kind of reversed up to about 90, even that's a big jump. It's a big yeah, jump. It is a big jump. Um, but it's at the upper end of last month's bounds, right? So, mm -hmm. so that cone of variability we talk about, it's kind of interesting because the model is kind of calling, model was seeing scenarios that would push it to that upward bound. And now we're kind of getting that. Um, we, you know, we don't we don't model the defense sector. And I know you and I talked about this last month in the, in the videos, but we're starting to see a surge in spending that's um, accelerating in the defense sector. And so anything touching primary metals in, in some of the big durable goods categories like automotive, um, aerospace, the defense sector, uh, anything in non-residential construction, we're starting to see some 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 good growth and some good development there, and so I think maybe the model's starting to wrestle with that a little bit and trying to see maybe a little more optimistic outlook. Again, yeah. I will call us the flattening, and I know the next next chart will kind of actually illustrate that for us. So yeah, you can see yeah. where it used to tail off significantly before. You can see it trying to creep back up towards trend over the long term, a little bit yeah. above trend initially, but not too far off of it. Yeah, it is interesting, too, because, you know, when we went into the Great Recession, we've talked about this before, where the Great Recession was interesting because it created a great reset and a lot of industries offshored a lot of business and a lot of procurement. And we know in the primary metal sector, you did see a lot of that offshoring at the time. And so that's what that long term downtrend looks like. And, you know, we're hearing and we're getting hints that maybe there's going to be an improvement in that activity and that, you know, you're going to start to see more onshoring of sourcing of primary metals and materials. And so maybe on a long-term basis, we start to see this curve over time over the next two years, start to really claw back out and maybe look a little more like what we saw in 2011, 2012. I mean, mm -hmm. that would be the, the highly optimistic side of things, but 
you listen to the federal government, you listen to the defense sector and other industries, they really want to try and get a lot of this production, you know, back as close as it can to, you know, this, this marketplace, the USMCA markets where we're consuming it. Sure. All right. So let's take a look at the spot between primary metals, getting it out of the ground and, and, and refining them and to IP man itself right there at fabricated metal. Uh, again, much like primary metal, a little bit of a, uh, a softening, not quite as much uh, of a softening of the dip, but you, you could see that the overall long-term outlook improved. The short-term took that uh, little bit of a dip out that we were seeing before on the, uh, uh, you know, where before we had this little bit of a rise, rather, uh, we, they kind of flattened that out and just bring it out over time. Yeah, this one, uh, yeah, I mean, you just said everything we probably need to say about it. It just, you know, the model didn't change that much month over month, except for that near-term bump and flattening it out. Uh, you know, and again, this is probably tied a little bit closer to what we see in the ISM and the S&P Global Manufacturing Surveys. You know, they see uh, demand dropping in some industries, but it is odd because in the durable sector, durable goods sector, we are seeing a little more demand. So the new orders data that came in from the federal government showed that some pockets of durable goods are still doing very, very well. And that may be kind of creating this flattening process where, you know, a little less optimism in some industries, a little more optimism in others kind of flattens it all out. And I think that might be what that trend is. Um, again, we'll look and see what happens over the next couple of months, but I, but I feel like Q3 is going to be kind of critical in setting the stage for the next 12 to 18 months after that. And it all has to do with consumption of inventories and pulling inventories down and whether the global supply chain kind of gets reset in the process of, you know, going through the next quarter. And mm -hmm. um, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I see a lot of different speculation on, you know, whether it's going to be, you know, complete reset, which means the global supply chain just gets completely retooled and everything upstream from raw materials and labor and energy all the way down through the manufacturing process and then down to consumption gets completely reset and everything starts working again? Or do we continue to see too much inventory in too many sectors and the whole upper end of the supply chain from the manufacturer up gets choked off because every time a new order flows into a manufacturer, they just go pull apart off the shelf and they fulfill the order that way. So, the, so from the manufacturer down to consumption, wholesalers and retailers, you still see activity and still see the part of the supply chain moving. But right now, today, everything above that is choked off. And that's the reason why the forecast and why the models and why a lot of the data is just kind of so weak at the moment, despite mm -hmm. consumer spending still being pretty good, you know, and consumption seemingly still being pretty good. Yeah. All right. And this is long term. Uh, what's nice about it is you see it sitting on trend and it, it, you it was a little bit of a softening of the outlook for in terms of it being a dip um, and now kind of bringing that up a little bit. But, you know, we're not too far off a trend, even at the far 18 month out. So we're, I think we're in reasonably decent shape on here, although uh, you, you, you can't help but notice that this is this sector overall is in decline in, in U.S. manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not much to add here, other than the fact that we're just going to continue to watch what happens with domestic reshoring activity. So we just got new updated construction spending data and in the manufacturing sector. So this is construction of manufacturing facilities, which the fabricated metals industry would react to. So that, that would be their customer base and driving business for fabricated metals. You know, we're seeing growth rates in that industry of about 73% year over year in new construction activity on roughly $190 billion in new spending. And that $190 billion um, is well above the long-term trend. Long-term trend was about 50 to 60 billion a year in spending. So we're, we're, we're eclipsing three times our normal dollar volume of spending in building construction, uh, building manufacturing capacity in the United States. And that should, on a long-term basis, you know, as you look at this long-term trend, should help kind of tilt that up. And you're gonna to start to see maybe these curves get a little more optimistic when we get through some of this economic weakness and some of the concern there. 
Okay, well, that concludes our look at industrial production at the macro level and then also primary metals and fabricated metals as major inputs. So we hope you enjoyed this video and you get you got something out of it. <laughs> All right, everybody. Take care. Take Thanks. Bye-bye.